Hello again everyone, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. I've had quite a few people bring up both the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes. People who don't believe the moon landings happened, asking why doesn't NASA point Hubble at the moon to show us the flag, and Flat Earth is asking why neither of these telescopes have been pointed to Earth to show that it's a globe. Now these ideas have some serious flaws with them, with regards to things like distances, angular size, effects of heat, and, well, the psychology of conspiracy theorists. Much of the problems is high school level stuff, apart from maybe the psychology of conspiracy theorists, but the rest of it is the kind of thing you could learn on Brilliant.org. They have hundreds of classes across many topics of math, science, and computing. If you enjoy learning new things, or even just testing yourself, then Brilliant is... Well, a brilliant way to do that, thanks to their very intuitive interactive animations and hints and explanations to help you if you're stuck. If you answer at least three questions per day, you keep a daily streak going. I'm currently up to 279 continuous days of answering questions. And if you want to really push yourself even more, they have weekly leagues based on how much experience you've earned from correctly answering questions. So see if you enjoy Brilliant as much as I've been doing by taking a free trial using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan. And the first 200 people to do so will receive 20% off an annual subscription. So let's begin with Hubble and the idea of pointing it to the moon to see the Apollo landing sites. Now, Hubble is a large telescope that was launched into Earth orbit back in 1990. Although it was by no means the largest telescope even at the time, telescopes here on Earth have a lot of atmosphere to look through, which reduces the quality of the images that they can produce. It's why most observatories are built high up on mountains to avoid as much atmosphere as possible. But Hubble avoids this problem entirely by sitting in an orbit about 330 miles above the Earth, where there is basically nothing to interfere with its images. As such, it's able to produce much clearer images of deep space than most telescopes here on Earth. So why can't we use it to view objects on the Moon? The Hubble has a focal length of 57.6 meters and its wide-field planetary camera produces an angle of view of around 0.05 degrees. So a very, very tight field of view, which is necessary for viewing deep space in detail. However, as it's only 300 miles above the Earth, it means it's still over 230,000 miles away from the Moon. From the Earth, the Moon has an angular size of about half of a degree. So it would certainly see much more detail of the Moon's surface than we can view from Earth, but as the Moon has a diameter of 2,159 miles, that would still give a view over 200 miles wide across the surface. The angular resolution limit of the Hubble is one-tenth of an arc second. Now, one degree can be split up into 60 arc minutes, and every arc minute can be split up into 60 arc seconds. So for every one degree, there is 3,600 arc seconds, and the Hubble can detect an object that is one-tenth of the size of one of those arc seconds, which is bloody impressive. However, the largest single object left behind on the Apollo missions was the descent stage of the lunar module, the main body of which was only 4.3 meters in diameter. So we're trying to view a four meter wide object from 230,000 miles away. Now, 230,000 miles is 370 million meters, which means a four meter wide object would have an angular size of 6.6560 to the negative seven degrees, or roughly 0 0.0024 arc seconds. That's about one five hundredth of an arc second, meaning the Apollo descent stage is roughly 50 times smaller than what would be required to be picked up by Hubble. To give you a sense of that sort of scale, one five hundredth of an arc second is the equivalent of looking out of a window of an aeroplane cruising at 35,000 feet, looking straight down to the ground and trying to see an object that is one tenth of a millimeter in diameter. The only hope you have of seeing such an object is by you moving closer to the object, such as the probes that have since gone to the moon and photographed the Apollo landing sites from lunar orbit. In fact, again, to get a sense of scale, 
Here are the images of the Apollo 11 landing site taken by probes in lunar orbit. Here's the lunar module descent stage. It's parked next to a small crater, which is what creates what appears to be a very short horizon in the Apollo 11 images. We have the footprints that Armstrong left as he walked away over to this larger crater and then took some images before walking back onto this area where Buzz Aldrin was setting up the science equipment. Here's a more zoomed out view of the area taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Probe. Again, the descent stage of the Eagle next to the small crater, the footprint heading over to Little West Crater, and then just over here to the right we have the larger West Crater. This was a, an image taken during Apollo 10 when they were scouting areas for a potential sites for Apollo 11 to land. And this is the Sea of Tranquility area that they landed in. This is a clipping of a newspaper that uses that Apollo 10 image and shows the area relative to the Moltke crater where Apollo 11 landed. And using that as reference, I was able to locate the West and Little West craters to show you just how small of an area we're dealing with here compared to an image that was taken only 100 miles above the lunar surface. Now, this image shows several of the craters around the edge of Mare Tranquilitas. Here is the Moltke crater. This shows us where Tranquility Base is. And here are two other craters named Collins and Armstrong. Those are the two craters at the bottom of the Apollo 10 image. Now we have some other craters here. We've got Sabine C, Aldrin, Sabine, Ritter, and then this large one down here, Delambra. Now this is a more zoomed out view of that area of the moon. Again, we can see Sabine and Ritter and Delambra here. And here is that area of the moon in comparison to the entire moon. So this shows you of the entire moon just how small of an area we are actually trying to see here. So basically, the objects left behind at the Apollo landing sites are just too small for the Hubble to view from low Earth orbit. Now, Hubble has actually been used to photograph the moon before. Here is an image it took of the crater Copernicus. And you can see it just doesn't have the focal length or the resolution to pick up tiny objects on the surface. I know people will probably think, hang on, why can we not see a four meter wide object on the moon, but we can see stars that are millions of light years away? And the key difference is that that is a point of light that you're trying to see. It's much easier to make out a point of light than actually render any detail of something. You will see lights way off in the distance before you can make out what that object is. Take, for example, the lights on aeroplane wings are only tiny little 5 watt bulbs, but you can see them at night much further away than you could see the plane itself. Or if you've ever been to a, a concert, an arena, or a stadium where everyone gets out their, their phone torches these days and waves them in the air, you can clearly see the spots of light from all the way across the arena in the pitch black. But when the arena lights are all up, you can't actually make out the phone across the way, you can only see the light from the phone. Anyway, now let's tackle Flat Earther's ideas of pointing Hubble at the Earth to show that it's a globe. Here, we have the complete opposite problem to pointing it at the moon. Hubble has an angle of view of 0 0.05 degrees, and it's 330 miles above the Earth. To put that into perspective, the globe has a diameter of 7,917 miles. My model globe behind me here is a scale of 1 to 42 million, meaning 1 centimeter on that model is equal to 42 million centimeters in reality. 330 miles is equal to 53,108,400 centimeters, meaning to scale, the Hubble Space Telescope would be orbiting 1.26 centimeters above this model globe. And with an angle of view of 0 0.05 degrees, it would be seeing a very small amount of Earth's surface. In fact, based on a triangle calculator with an apex height of 330 miles and a vertex angle of 0 0.05 degrees, gives a baseline of only a quarter of a mile wide meaning Hubble wouldn't even be able to show us one square mile of Earth's surface, much less show that it's an actual globe. So ultimately, Hubble couldn't physically manage either of those ideas. However, what about James Webb? That is much further away than Hubble. It's a million miles from Earth, orbiting the Sun at the second Lagrange point. Details suggest that its field of view is similar to Hubble's. At a million miles away, that gives us a field of view about 800 miles wide. 
which would give James Webb a similar view of Earth that the Hubble would get pointing at the moon. And it makes sense we would see similar diameters, given that James Webb is four times further away from Earth than Hubble is from the moon, but the Earth is about four times larger than the moon. Although that would arguably be enough to make out that it's a globe, there is another crucial factor that means this won't ever happen. Heat. The James Webb differs from the Hubble in many aspects. Not just how it's orbiting us or having a much larger mirror, but its equipment is designed to pick up near infrared light. However, infrared light is essentially heat. So any heat within the equipment will show up as infrared radiation within the images. As such, James Webb is designed to operate at less than minus 230 degrees Celsius. This allows James Webb to see much more detail within the universe. This is why the Lagrange Point 2 was chosen, as it keeps the telescope locked in position relative to Earth, so it can remain in constant contact with us, while still being further away from the Sun than we are, so it orbits such that its telescope is always aiming away from the Sun, and it has five layers of reflective insulation which sits between the telescope itself and the Sun. So the telescope is basically kept in a constant shadow. So as James Webb is further away from the sun than Earth, any attempt to turn it to face the Earth would result in the equipment being brought into direct sunlight, causing it to heat up. Now, assuming best case scenario that that didn't screw up any of the components, firstly, any image attempting to photograph Earth, probably the Earth wouldn't be resolvable because the telescope would just be flooded with infrared light from the sun. And then, once it was turned back around into deep space, they then couldn't use it for several days because it would need to cool back down. Which is rather a waste of time of a $10 billion telescope when there are numerous satellites able to produce clear images of the Earth being a globe. Which brings us to the ultimate problem with both of these ideas. Even if they could fulfill the ideas of these conspiracy theorists, it probably wouldn't make a blind bit of difference to their opinions anyway. Flat Earthers already say every image from satellites that show the Earth as a globe are just CGI. They say every image from those two telescopes showing the universe, or even sh just showing planets within our solar system, are all CGI. So those telescopes that they don't think exists, then producing images of a globe that they don't think exist, will undoubtedly still just get dismissed as CGI. And it's a similar problem for the moon landing deniers. There have been multiple probes, not just from NASA, but also from India, Japan, and China, who've all observed the Apollo landing sites and found evidence that the landings actually took place. Not only producing images of the equipment and the tracks left behind at the landing site, but even one of the probes did a stereoscopic 3D scan of Hadley Ridge, where Apollo 15 landed, and found that the terrain in that area of the moon perfectly matched the terrain seen in the background of the Apollo 15 photographs. But that still gets dismissed by people, so if they're unwilling to accept all of those, then they're unlikely to accept images from a NASA telescope. But that's going to be it for this video. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring it. If you've enjoyed it and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.